All right. Welcome back. All right, everybody. Here we go. Forms. Convert your form. Take your form to digital in under 30 minutes. All right. Uh, as many of you are familiar with from this morning, I'm Eric. I'm a consultant and trainer at Cities Digital. Everyone on the simulcast may not have met me in person or know what my face looks like, but you do now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a PDF form and turn it into a web form using Laser Peach Forms. So to start with, we're going to take a look and see our PDF form that we're going to start out with. And we're actually only going to do the first page of this sample employment form. But it's a pretty standard form, pretty straightforward. It's got a lot of different fields, address, name, uh, you know, how long you've been working at certain places, social security numbers, standard fields that you'd see on an employment application form. And I'm going to show you how to turn it from a paper form, like you should all have on your table now, into a web form. So to do this, we'll transfer over to the virtual machine here. and close out some of these tabs, since we have so many. All right, so we'll start by just creating the process to begin with, which is very easy. You just do that from the Manage page here on, on Forms. We'll log in again. So to create a new form, you just click on the new process button up here at the top and you give it a name. You can choose an available template. I typically start with the form submission because it's either going to be going straight into Laserfiche or it's going to need to be a little more complicated than the normal approval. So I'll just give it the title of Lhasa Workshop Form. Not very creative, but it gets the point across. So we'll hit create process and what it's going to do is it's going to bring us to the process modeler and we're not going to really do anything with this right now but we will come back to it. Where we actually want to edit the form is under the forms tab. And now you can see we have this blank canvas to work with. We'll give our form a title. So the first thing we're going to do is name it employment application form. And then we're going to want to think about how we want to break down this existing form into Laserfiche form fields. In Laserfiche forms, we have a few different fields uh, that we can use. We have a single line field, a multi line field, radio buttons, check boxes, drop downs, and a file upload. Below that, you'll notice there's a little line break here, and that's because these ones get a little more specialized and a little less customizable. We have the address, which is actually a table configured like your standard address, you know, address sign one, two, city, state, zip code, country, uh, number field, which only accepts numbers, email, which automatically um, determines whether you entered a valid email address or not, uh, date, which comes with a, a date picker in this case, so you, when it's on there, it has the little calendar there, so you can select a specific date, currency, which is pretty self-explanatory, but can be formatted to just about any currency. I believe they even have a Bitcoin on there if you want to use that. Uh, and then the signature field, which is built in in, in Forms 9.2. So if you're familiar with the old signature fields that we saw in 9.1 that were made with uh, a lot of copied and pasted code out of a text file, these ones are actually just built in and much more streamlined. Below that, we have a few special area fields. The custom HTML allows you to add blocks of text. So if we look at our sample application form, you can see the uh, please print all information requested, things like that. Anything that's going to be just a static block of instructional text. Or if you remember from this morning when we looked at the tuition reimbursement form, we had a very large disclaimer about what situations can be used in, what it covers, what it doesn't cover. That's just a custom HTML field filled with text. You can also use these custom HTML fields for specialized applications like 
creating custom buttons in the form if you're using things like JavaScript and doing some extended uh, functionality in the form like calculations and things like that. The section is exactly what it sounds like. It just breaks things apart into sections. Uh, what we didn't see when we looked at that tuition reimbursement form is it's actually collapsible. So that section where it talks about when it, when it, when it, or when it can and can't be used, uh, that's actually collapsible. So once you read it or if you've read it several times already and you're filling it out again, you can just collapse it so you don't have to look at it. Um, the collection allows a user to repeat several sections of fields over and over and over again. So if you have, say, references listed in this and you want to include up to you know, anywhere between one and four or one and three, you can set up a collection so you can add a reference up to three or four times. And it will just be uh, like a combination of several fields. So if we add the collection here, we could add a couple of single line fields to this. And then if we preview that, you can actually just keep repeating that. And because I didn't put any limitations on it, you could repeat it forever. But um, you typically want to put limitations on that. But we're not going to start with that collection. The last thing is a table. And uh, I'll go into more detail about how the table works when we actually put one on there. But the table allows you to put a very large combination of different types of fields all together in one specific area. And it's really useful. So we'll see that when we get down to the type of schools, things like that. So to start off with, we're going to need to get some demographic information on our applicant. So for our simulcast viewers, we're looking at our name, last, first, middle, maiden name if applicable. And we'll want to put a present address field in this form as well. So we'll go back to forms. And we'll need to break that apart into single line fields because there's not one really large single line field that can encompass last, first, middle, things like that. So what we'll want to do is drag a single line field on here and we'll just change it to last name. And what we can do is we can actually duplicate this field, select last and put first. And again, duplicate this and do middle initial. But it doesn't need to be that long for a middle initial. So we could change the width of this field to small. So it's not as, as large as the other two. And then we can add a maiden name field. And we can add a little bit of descriptive text that just says uh, if applicable. So now you can see we have just a little bit of information about the field if it needs to be there. Next, for our address, why don't we use the address block? We'll just drag this onto the form. And it already says address, but maybe we want it to just be a little more uh, specific, so we'll say present address. And at any point, you can make any of these fields required. So if there's some specific things that you know for sure you're going to need, you could make last name and first name both required fields. And it'll prevent you from submitting this without that information on it. Now, if we look at the form that we're working on, you'll notice there is a how long field. Now, it's, it's not very self-explanatory because how long, of how long what? It doesn't really say that. So one good thing to keep in mind when you're turning a paper form into a laser for each form is this is always a really good time to reconsider some of the things that are on the form already because there might be information that you don't need anymore. Maybe you've been using the same form for 20 years now and you realize, you know, we never use that information. Why do we need to even ask for it? But uh, in this case, it's, you, know, you, can, you can assume it means how long have you lived at this address. Uh, 
so we can actually expand on that because we have a little bit of more a little bit of extra room so we can either use a single line field in this case or we can use a number field so we could say um, could say how long have you lived at this address and then since we're using a number field we could set a range so obviously we don't want to use negative numbers because that that doesn't make any sense so we can put the text below field and we can just specify that we want this in years. And you'll notice sometimes when you drag fields onto here, they get a little bit out of order and you can just reposition those by clicking and dragging if you're doing them quickly. Um, so next we'll want to add our social security number fields and a telephone field. So since we want to see this with dashes, what we could do is we could say social security number. And then we can give some instruction here. So we could say we want this to be formatted like that. And if we duplicate this field, we can turn this into a phone number. And just add one more number in the middle there. Now, obviously, the social security number and the phone number won't need to be in a field this long because it's that's only going to fill it up about halfway. So we could switch this into small again, much like we did with the middle initial. And it just seems a little bit more fitting. Next, we can add a position applying for. And now a lot of times when you have uh, job postings, things like this, you have a lot of static information going on. So you could actually tie this to a lookup if you wanted to. So if you have your job postings listed in a database somewhere and you wanted to tie that to this form, you could do that. You could use a drop down just to limit, um, you know, so people don't apply for jobs that aren't actually open. So let's use the drop down for this and we'll say, um, position applying for and then we'll give it some values so we could say um, let's say this is a restaurant so we're looking for a dishwasher a prep cook or a line cook and now if we look at the preview of this we can see where our form is so far so we've got our first name and our last name fields Middle initial, maiden name if applicable, address, how long have you lived here? And you can actually use the arrow key to select number of years. You can even use the scroll wheel if you highlight or if you keep your cursor in the field if you want to do that. <laughs> um, and then we've got our drop down list for what we're applying. So next, let's take a look at our form again just to refresh what the form looks like for the simulcast viewers. Um, so we have a salary desired, so we can select, uh, so we can put a single line field on for this, although I think a currency field would probably be more applicable. So let's add that and then let's add this section here, which is our days and hours available to work. So we'll go back to forms and we'll add our currency field. And we'll say um, salary desired. And then below field, we could say per hour. Because this, this is going to be an hourly job. I don't think they salary dishwashers. <laughs> so well, for our days and hours available to work, I think this would be a good one to use a table for. So what we can do is put a table right here and it kind of put it in a weird spot so we'll move it down and because we're going to kind of re-engineer re this we'll say we'll just call this weekly availability 
And now we have a couple of different columns. It starts out with two columns, but you can add more columns, you can subtract columns, however you want to do this. Uh, but what we can do is we could say, have a column for every week, or for every day of the week, not every week. <laughs> I've started calling uh, a labor name for Eric Foreman. <laughs> so now we have a column for every one of these days and a single row. And we'll just hide the row labels and set it to a fixed number of rows, which will just be one. This too. So we can take a look at a couple different ways of creating this table. This might work for what you're trying to do. So if you say, you know, if we could switch this to, um, we could switch this to radio buttons, and then adjust the options on the radio button to just be AM and PM. So for example, if we look at Monday, you could select whether you're available mornings or nights on Monday, things like that. Uh, if you wanted to get a little more specific, there's another way that we can set this up. And I'll just get rid of all of these columns that we just made. And we could do a similar thing, but use the, use the rows. So we could say seven rows, and then we could make our row labels our days of the week. So we could say... We could set it up like this, and now we could add more columns just to specify maybe more information if you want it to be a little more specific about when during the week you can work, AM or PM is preferred, you know, things like that. Um, so if we go through and look at our column options, we could say, um, we could call this just AM, PM preference. maybe a, a number of hours. And that's that's probably good for this. So we have our AM, PM preference with our radio button. We can actually go into our field options and we can change the orientation of this. So I'm sure you noticed it was one on top of the other one. So you can set this to be side by side. And now, as you can see, it's side by side now. And then for our number of hours, we could just set that to be a number field like the other one. And we might want to add some constraints to it too, just like we did before with, you know, we don't want to work negative hours. And if you're selecting AM, PM, let's just say we don't want them to work more than 12 hours at a time. So now we've taken what was originally just a uh, free form, put whatever you want in here option and given it some just a little more uh, specificity. And we also kind of eliminated the need for these two following fields because we included those into our table to begin with. So now we can go for our employment desired, which is full-time, part-time, or full or part-time. So let's switch over there and let's use a radio button for this one as well. But this one's going to be its own radio button field. So now we can say, uh, we can call this employment status desired. And we can put our options from the original form, which was full time only, part time only. or full or part-time. And then we can add a date field for our
when are you available to start? And just like our number fields, we can add year ranges to this. And I don't want them saying they could start yesterday. I definitely don't want them saying they could start, you know, more than a year from now, because why are they applying? <laughs> so this might be really useful. Another thing we could do is we could add maybe a date field up here at the top that just says date of application. <coughs> but we could make this read only and we could set it to use today's date as the default. So now if we preview this, we have today's date up at the top of this application, a lot of demographic information about the employee, availability, employment status, and when they can start. And that didn't take us very long at all. I know, we're under 30 minutes so far. <laughs> don't quote, don't quote them on that. So now we could go in and we could do a table for our education. So just like we did for our other one, we'll take a table onto this canvas. And we'll just call this table education background. And this one, let's try and make it exactly like the one that's on the table, which for our simulcast viewers looks like this. Type of school, name of school, location. We'll leave out the complete mailing address because that always drove me nuts on my own applications. So who knows that? I sure don't. Uh, number of years completed and the degree achieved. So we'll head back to forms and we'll build out this table. So let's start with our columns. So we have our name of school. Location, general. <laughs> Number of years completed. And major or degree. Now, name of school and location could still be single line fields. It's just general information. Number of years, again, we'll use that number field and we'll set our field options again to not accept negative numbers. But I do want to know if they spent nine years working on their bachelor's degree. And then major and degree can also be a single line. Now we have high school, college, business trade school and professional school listed as options. So we use a fixed number of rows and we'll set it to four. And then we'll set our row labels. And there's our table. Now if we do a preview, you're going to notice that it looks a little cramped. Doesn't really have a whole lot of room, gives you a really large field for something that's probably only going to be one digit, things like that. So what we can do is we can actually adjust the width of these fields. So if we go back into the properties on this, you can see percentages here. So for our name of school, maybe we want this to be 25%. Our location doesn't need to be that uh, exact, so we could do 20%. This one could be 15%, and this one could be 15%. And now we've got a bit of variation in the widths of the fields. One thing to consider is the name of your column headers, because if you look at the number of years completed, it's got three line breaks, so that might be a little tough to look at. So you might want to consider maybe shortening the way that it's written, maybe using some symbols. So if we did just number <laughs> of years, that might just be a little easier to look at.
And lastly, on this single page that we're going to do here, we just want to know if they've been convicted of a crime and how bad it was. <laughs> so, again, we'll use a radio button. And just out of curiosity, can anybody tell me the difference between a radio button and a checkbox? Yep, exactly. Radio button only lets you pick one, or a checkbox, you can select all of them. So for this one, we use the radio button because there's it's a yes or no question. <laughs> there's no gray area here. And we'll set it to exactly what we'd expect, yes or no. And have you ever been convicted of a crime. On the radio buttons, do you have a possibility to have more than just the two selections? So say there's a different type of form on the application. It, say you had to pick one of three. Yep, that's what we have set up for the part-time, full-time. You can also add a, uh, it doesn't apply to this specific uh, you know, specific field, but you can also add another, which allows you to put some input here. Um, you can also change what it says for others. So if you have something specific and you have something, you know, anything you want specified when they select that, you can select the other choice and give it a new name. Something, something along those lines. So for our last one, we want a little bit of a description. Um, there's a whole lot of language here on the form itself asking, you know, explain the number of conviction, nature of offenses. Um, we're just going to have a little fun with this one, and I'm just going to say how bad was it. That's a little easier, I think. <laughs> yeah, how'd you get away with it? And now if we preview this form. Yes, question? Uh, not required per se, but what I can do, and I, I was actually just going to show you that, uh, the question was if they click yes, can we make this field required for the simulcast viewers? Uh, we can make it required, but then under our, uh, scroll all the way to the top, under the field rules, what we can set up for this is we can have it show how bad was it when have you ever been convicted of a crime is yes. Can you set a minimum number of characters? <laughs> a minimum number of characters. Because it's a required field, they can just put a space bar right? or one in there. Yeah, there's, um, you can't really put a required number of characters in the field. You might be able to get creative with the JavaScript, but I'd have to research that. But in this case, have you ever been convicted of a crime, yes or no? It doesn't even show that required field. And if the field rules don't show it, then it's not required. So it, it'll let you submit it without it filled in until you select yes. And now it, now it won't let you submit it until you fill that in. Field rules are actually, now that, now that we've gotten to the field rules point, field rules are a great way to take a really long form and shorten it up based on, you know, what information you actually need. So depending on what's submitted in the form, what's been selected, you may need more information or there may be an entire section of the form that doesn't even need to be filled out. And, you know, on a paper form where it says only fill this out if you answered yes to line 38, then that would be uh, a way to build this into the form. Yes? If you have a drop down and you have a list of departments, you, if, and you don't want it to show, say, well, our first account, our first drop down is accounting. You want a blank there. How do you do that? Because if I put in a blank, oh, if I put in a blank, it won't work. And if I um, just leave accounting, and some people choose accounting, no matter what department they're in. Right. <laughs> Um, I think in that situation, it would either be beneficial to have a um, 
maybe a toggle that says no department necessary. So it would either so it would be tied to field rules, showing that uh, you know if they select no department necessary, then it doesn't even show that drop down, um, as opposed to putting a blank space. Although I do believe well, they would have to have they would have to have a department. Um, I, first, I had choose a department, and a lot of times they'd leave it as choose a department. <laughs> oh right. You know, instead of picking their actual department. Because what I have them do is pick a department, and then um, from there it goes to a lookup table and says, "These are the managers that can approve this. Pick your manager." Oh right. Huh. So how do you get the default to be blank? Is what you said. Yeah, I love the default blank. Oh, the default to be blank. Um, she is asking if there's a way to make a default be blank for the drop-down fields. Well, by default, it's set to no value. Automatically, so I'm not sure. What if um, you have just the options and just hit enter, leaving option one blank? Line one would be blank. Or you could take the other part if necessary. Well, I think the question is if you have position applying for the way it is right now and it's required, could you submit the form with that blank one? No, okay. you'd have to select one. It's it's starting out as populated. It starts out as populated. Hmm. We might want to take a look at that because it shouldn't be starting out populated. That's why I <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, so now. Any more questions? We are a little bit behind schedule. This is a trade presentation. We have one more yet. Get going. We have a few more minutes for another. Any other questions for Eric? Are you able to like them in your um, descriptions there? I mean, your, your header column is tiny compared to... Yep. You can actually take the form and you can adjust the width. So you can set this to be a wider form. So if we set this to, a, not 10,000, but 1,000 pixels, it'll be a little bit wider. Right now it's set to automatically optimize the form layout for small browsers. So if you're looking at this through, uh, through your phone or through an iPad, It'll actually adjust the scaling so it fits better. Um, if you know it's going to be always filled out on a computer, you might want to get rid of that, especially if you have some custom CSS formatting going on in the background. And you can also set the width of our labels to be larger. So we'll set this to medium. And now when we preview it, it's going to be a bit wider and we have a lot more space. So yeah, you can adjust that. And any kind of fine tuning that you want to do with label length and input field length and things like that, you can do through custom CSS. Um, I won't really go into that because it'll take an hour in itself, but um, it's definitely doable. I have a question. What if this person's done and I want to submit a like, plot month, you know, submission form? How could I make this like custom? Well, uh, <laughs> he wants to know if it's Christmas time, how can I make this form look festive? Uh, there is a themes tab right here. <laughs> and if you click on the themes tab, there are a number of different default themes that may or may not look good. Um, <laughs> but we've got this spooky Halloween theme. <laughs> But you can also create your own custom themes. So for uh, we looked at some the travel request form this morning for our uh, URS, and this is the theme that you can apply to all of those individual forms. Can you import CSS custom? Uh, not exactly. What you can do is if you have if you're able to edit them, you can copy and paste the CSS into here but you'd need to target the specific fields on the form itself. <coughs> and like I said, this, this whole section here can get pretty complicated, so I'll limit how much I'm talking about this. Um, we saw social security numbers and phone numbers. Are there any foot masks that can be applied? Or? Yes, you can, uh, with the JavaScript, you can load other scripts into it. So it's, it's predominantly jQuery. And 
I've used the jQuery input mask library to create input masks on some of our forms. So we just email you and copy you? Uh, it, it's going to need to be catered to specifically what you're trying to design it for. But um, our Empower registration form, if you've looked at that yet, I have some phone number input masks on all the phone number fields. And those that's exactly what I used for that, is the jQuery input mask library. So if you get a chance to go fill out that Empower registration form, which I highly recommend you do. <laughs> All right, any other questions about building forms? All right. Well, since we're, we're a little beyond where we expected to be, I'll uh, dive right into the next one, which is... Also, actually, before we use anybody is going to be joining us, there's an update on the room for the uh, uh, networking event. That's what we're calling it, networking event upstairs. It is the Lincoln. Lincoln room. Lincoln room. So anybody who didn't use a few minutes early to get started, it's Lincoln room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for the next one, we're going to talk about barcode. Uh, actually, I'll switch to the PowerPoint so we can see exactly what the exactly what the slide is called, but it's barcode and asset tracking with barcodes. There it is. Um, so I put together a demo that details a lot of different barcode images that I took with my smartphone and saved into Laserfiche. I'm also going to try and take a picture and upload over a VPN and using this barcode sticker right here so everybody at home can see. <laughs> So I'm going to use my, uh, my phone and Laserfiche Mobile to take a picture of this barcode and upload it into the demo Laserfiche system. So we'll go right here, and we'll go to barcode. And now I'll load up Laserfiche Mobile. There we go. So for anybody who is not familiar with Laserfeech Mobile for the Android, uh, a lot of you probably can't see it very well because it's a phone. But uh, through the simulcast, you should be able to see what the Android app looks like. Uh, we'll be signing in. And we'll select our barcode folder. And I'll hit the plus. And what we can do is we can add documents or take pictures, upload pictures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture of this barcode. You might be asking yourself, why on earth would I ever do this? <laughs> One thing being asset tracking, you need a picture of an asset, and there happens to be a barcode on it and you'd like to have that archived in Laserfish, barcodes can be read, but also think about it from a physical records management perspective. Like if you have a box with a big barcode on it and it's in the physical record storage, you're never going to get rid of it, but you just want to have inventory of it. Laserfish can actually put an inventory, so create a template and essentially a placeholder with that picture of the box and what's been written on it. Because a lot of times Iron Mountain and those guys always have barcodes or you might have it in your own record center. Just another way to, to use it, right? Right. So for this one, we're going to be filling out the barcode asset tracking template. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the a cord to display the phone, but that would be pretty sweet. Um, so we'll fill this out with an item description, which is going to be uh, employment application, <laughs> and an item location, which is going to be the Jefferson room. And we'll just save that into our folder. Oh, look, there it is. So now we'll just, oh, it uploaded really fast, too. That's a good thing. Uh -huh. So now we have our new document. This is the image that I took. Picture of this barcode on the sample application form, employment application in the Jefferson room. 
you'll notice there's no barcode ID, and that's because we're going to process this with quick fields, along with several of our old documents. I'll just put some of these in here as well. Just to get an idea, I'll set this to thumbnails view so you can see, get an idea of the different kinds of images we have here. Some of them are black and white. Some of them are have a lot of shade going on. Some of them are pretty, you know, crystal clear what this is. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go to our barcode asset tracking quick field session. Now, the way that I would set this up in practice is I would have this run through QuickField's agent so somebody could go through and they could take pictures of barcodes all day uh, <laughs> indicating what it is, where it is, what kind of information it might contain. If these are, you know, if these are barcode stickers on records boxes, you could take a picture of the barcode and indicate where it is and what records are in it, things like that. Or do a lookup for the barcode, right? Possibly an yeah. outside database? That maybe? too. Okay. And <laughs> overnight or on a schedule, we could run this quick field session to go through and identify all the barcodes and as it identifies them, it automatically stores them because this is designed to be run through quick fields agents. So automatically it's going to store them. Any of the ones that it wasn't able to identify, if it wasn't able to identify them, it's going to go into their own folder for review. So we'll switch this back to details view. And if we go into our assets folder, unidentified assets, and these are undoubtedly from earlier presentations. Um, yeah, from earlier tests, except for these ones right here. Two of these weren't able to be identified. But in the Jefferson room, we have the employment application. And we got our barcode ID. and. Because the label printer prints them like this, you can see that the barcode actually says 100,000, 100,005, and that's our barcode ID. So it was successfully read by QuickField's. If we look in what's in Eric's office, apparently I have four Dell computers, a couple of iPads, <laughs> <laughs> or I took many pictures of the same thing, which is more the case. Um, so you might be wondering, well, that's great. What what good is all this information here in Laserfish? Uh, if we go to SQL, I actually have this tied to a workflow that keeps a table updated with all the barcode IDs, item location, item description, and when it was updated, so when it was actually placed in that location. You can expand this to have even more information about these items, if you know, depending on the application that you're using it for. But specifically for this one, I'm just using it for item tracking, specifically what it is, where it is, and when it was put there. So when somebody theoretically takes that computer and moves it to a different office, or the iPad makes its way to a different office, somebody can go in, take a picture of it, and upload that the way that I just did, and it'll update this database, showing that it's moved to a different office. Great, thank you. Very good. This was like a MacGyver test for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Eric was really scratching his head wondering why I wanted to see this. But again, this was a request from a user that said, I want to see this. How can we do that? So just an example, uh, you know, real world example here. Somebody wanted that, and I'm sure somebody's going to call up and say how great it is. Let's do this after, afterwards. But um, we have a few extra minutes before we're done. Um, we kind of rushed through the questions from forums. We got some barcodes and quick fields and an integration into the SQL database. Does anybody have any additional questions? Yes. Uh, can you have like uh, say you have another application that you export into like a CSV file and forms either read a CSV file and convert it into this layout like you did, or does it have to be like a PDF? Uh, specifically with forms. Uh, we actually have that uh, copy-paste integration that we built. Yeah, we have. If you're doing tabular data in forms, we built a tool that will allow you to take uh, to actually select a bunch of fields in Excel, and then select the form and just hit 
it's paste. Yeah, you just copy the fields in Excel and paste them into the multi-line field. So it's going to populate all the tables um, in as many rows as it needs to be. If it's a thousand rows, it will just fill that whole entire forms table. So people don't have to take from Excel and then manually data enter it. That's one option. I don't know if we did we hit did we hit what you were looking at there? Yeah. Did I ask a question. Great. Any other questions? Boy, you guys are all troopers. You have stuck around the whole day. Everybody has been here all day. Thank you. Um, yes. Do you have like the sort of form you already have it so you know that it go online and fill it out? Yes. So what would we do to make it work? Oh, well, what you could do is you could translate that into a laserfiche form the way we just did and just start using the laserfiche form to replace it. Or if it's a fillable PDF that you really like and you really want to keep around, what you can do is you can actually use the laserfiche form to capture those field values and then workflow as a fill out fillable PDF activity. So you could take all the information you just captured in LaserFiche forms and you could put it into a fillable PDF in LaserFiche automatically. And then you can you can get the benefits of having the LaserFiche forms accessibility and how easy it is to fill out. But then it'll put it into the old format that you're used to dealing with already. Yes. Like this. this is form again all over again. <laughs> I like this. Uh, no, they don't have anything like that. It's very much uh, start from scratch. Is there anything that stops a community from doing that? Because you just designed this. No. There's, there's, there's nothing stopping that from happening. What happens with forms is you can actually export them, and it's just an XML file. So anybody who's running the same version of forms that you were when you exported that, can import that into their system, and they can use the same form. Right, so if you put together a forms community where you're sharing ideas, you could just keep a, an online repository of XML files for forms. That's also for workflows, too. You can share workflows. Yep, you can export workflows. Uh, workflows are kind of a little more difficult and tricky to import because they rely on a lot of connection profiles and things like that, but the same concept applies. Yes. In your last um, Facebook conference that we went to, you talked about uh, connecting Esri with LaserFeach. Do you have anybody here that's using Esri and LaserFeach that has connectors to some of the pieces and parts to them? We don't have anybody using uh, Esri that's here today. So it's Arc IMS is connected directly into LaserFeach WebLink or Web Access. And that is, uh, that's live if you'd like it. We can show you a demo of it. Um, we can get set up as a trial. There's a whole bunch of options for you. Uh, but it is web link, web access, and archive events right now. And that's an add-on. That's a special, it's a new program called. But uh, that is something where version one, it's been released. We do have users using it in production. And uh, we'll continue to update it. So. If you have some special feature requests, let us know. Um, and uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with ArcIMS, that's uh, um, map, map layer and tying a web link or web access to it. So you'd be able to pull up documents in the browser viewer. Any other questions, ideas? OK, well, I would thank everybody uh, here for attending. Online? It's been great having you here. It's been great meeting everybody. And I hope that you join us in the Lincoln Room. Remember that this community is uh, is what it is based upon all your participation. So I really do appreciate you coming out and getting to, to meet everyone. And remember that the simulcast is always there. We try to do this every month, but we're going to take a few months off towards the winter time as and power kicks in in January. So we're going to give our guys a break, and and uh, we'll continue though probably in the spring. So we have another one, and it's September 17th. It's already posted on our website. Remember, you can sign up for the simulcast. We get a special notice for that. We'll be in Austin at the University of Texas. And if you have ideas, you have suggestions, concerns, send them to us, uh, either to Sean, myself, Eric, whoever you'd like to email. Let us know that you have a request for next user group, and we'll try to do something like this MacGyver move that we had uh, Eric create.